I want you to turn to Colossians 3. Colossians 3, verse 1. And I want to preach to you today about getting your heart back in tune. Getting your heart back in tune. You know, sometimes we get out of tune. Sometimes we get out of whack. Sometimes things happen and we're trying to figure out how do I get my life back on track? How do I get my attitude, my mindset, my thoughts, my emotions, really my heart back in that place? And so Paul the Apostle said in Colossians 3, verse 1, since then you have been raised with Christ which we just saw people get raised with Christ in the baptism tanks, just coming out of the water. When you decide to go public with Jesus, you've been raised with Christ. Those who just publicly made a declaration that Jesus is their Lord, you've been raised with Christ. He says, set your hearts on things above. Paul said, set your heart. He didn't say God should set your heart or let your spouse set your heart. He said, you set your heart. Set your own heart. You're in charge of your own soul. You are the gardener of your soul and your heart. The heart is not the best leader. The world says, follow your heart. The world says, do whatever your heart tells you. But my heart can tell me some crazy stuff sometimes. Sometimes my heart is like not always the the best leader. How many of y'all can attest to that in your own life, right? Jeremiah 17, the prophet, he said in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, he said, the heart is deceptive above all else. The heart can uh, oftentimes lead us astray. The heart can be a liar sometimes, right? Uh, It's not the best leader. The heart oftentimes is kind of like an instrument. An instrument is not bad or good. It's it's what we do with the instrument. The instrument doesn't make bad music or good music. It makes whatever the person who's playing it influences it. And in the same way, your heart is not bad or good. It's, It's what we do with our heart. It's what we meditate on. It's what we allow our hearts to dwell on. This is why Paul says, set your heart. Everybody say, set your heart. He says, set your heart, not on things below, not on things that are going on around you, but set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And then he says in verse two, he says, and while you're at it, set your minds too. Set your heart and set your minds because our minds and our hearts, they're connected. Our thoughts and our emotions, they're connected. And as a heart goes, so goes a person. As the emotions go, so goes the man, so goes the woman. As the thoughts go, so goes the marriage, the family, the future. This is why Paul says we gotta set our hearts. We gotta set our minds. We gotta continually bring them back to things above and not below. Okay, one more place I want you to look, and that's 1 Samuel 30. 1 Samuel 30. And when you get there, you can shout if you want to. You can make some noise. Yeah. Man, I missed you guys. I don't know if y'all missed me, but I missed (laughs) y'all. I was like, I wonder if they missed us, Ashley. I don't know. No, it's good. It's so good to see you guys. You know, I, there were so many sermons coming to me during our time off that I was like, which one should I preach? And our kids pastor said, I'm prepared. If you preach three hours, we'll keep things going for the kids ministry. I was like, I can't hold people captive for three hours, but I do have a lot to share on my heart. And I'm excited about revival nights. So I'm gonna save some of this for revival nights. Because listen, I don't want y'all to miss those three nights of revival in August. It's going to be fire. We got Russell Johnson, Dino Rizzo, Lindy Kofer coming. It's going to be a powerful time of just seeking God. But as I'm, I'm looking at this, 1 Samuel 30, verse 1, if there was ever a moment for David to tune his heart, it was right here. And David had a lot of moments where he needed to get in tune. But it was right here in 1 Samuel 30, David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. And the Amalekites, which was an enemy to David, they had raided the Negev and Ziklag and they attacked David's hometown. Now David wasn't the king yet, he had been anointed to be the king. He had been told by Samuel the prophet, you will lead Israel. And yet that anointing didn't lead to a direct appointing. You could be anointed to something but not be appointed to something. You could be prophesied that it's going to happen but it may not happen for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And so David was living with the prophetic word that hadn't been fulfilled, and he's coming back to his hometown. He had been dodging spears. King Saul had been hunting him down, trying to kill him, and uh, David had been living for 14, 15 years with a prophetic word that had not been fulfilled. So he had been told when he was 15, 16 years old he would be the king, now he's 31, still hasn't happened. But this is the chapter right before he's promoted. Sometimes you go through a crisis right before you're promoted. Sometimes you go through a storm right before God's about to elevate you. Sometimes you go through things that are confusing and sometimes God will blind your friends 
from seeing what you need in a moment because God wants you to do it yourself. Sometimes God will actually mute people in your life from encouraging you because God wants you to learn to encourage yourself. And you're like, why hasn't anybody encouraged me or helped me? Does anybody love me? And God's getting ready to promote you. And it's not that those friends are against you, it's that they don't see what you're walking through emotionally. They're not aware. And maybe because God doesn't want them to see. Maybe God wants you to figure this out on him. Maybe God's pulling some crutches out in your life because you've been leaning on the crutch of friends, leaning on the crutch of family, and God says, I want you to lean completely on me. So David finds himself discouraged in verse two. Look at this. 1 Samuel 30, verse two, when he comes back, they had taken his wife, they had taken his kids, not just his wife, but every man's wife had been kidnapped, stolen, carried away. They lost their families. And one day their, their town was burned to the ground. Their wives were kidnapped. Their kids were kidnapped. No one had been killed, but they were all distraught. When David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire. The fire had burned their hometown. All their houses had burned to the ground. And it says in verse four that he wept and the men around him wept until they had no strength left to weep. Have you ever cried so much you had no strength left to cry? I remember when my dad passed and I cried so hard for several weeks and, and because there was just more sad news. It wasn't just him being gone. It was just this everything connected to it and the state of our family and the sense of loss and shock. And, and, and then it got to the point where I couldn't cry anymore. And it wasn't that I wasn't sad. It's, I had no strength to cry. And so I was just in this dumbfounded, disillusioned state. Bill Johnson, who's coming back to preach next year at our church, he said this one time at one of our conferences. He said, the two things that take Christians away from church and from God is number one, bitterness, and number two, disappointment. Bitterness at people who hurt them. I can't forgive this person, what they did to my family, what they did to my dad, what they did to my wife, what they did to my kids. I can't forgive them. Bitterness takes people out. And that's that, that spirit of unforgiveness, just resentment. And the second thing is disappointment. I was counting on God to do something. I was counting on his protection, but now the people I love most are taken from me. I was counting on his provision, but now we've hit bankruptcy. I was counting on this to have disappointment can cause people to fully walk away. So David and his men, they're distraught, they're distracted, they're discouraged. And I want you to skip down to verse, uh, verse six. Verse six, it says, so David was greatly distressed. I want my team to come bring some boxes out because I want you to see probably some of you in the room are dealing with your own types of stress. And I was talking to this guy recently. He was telling me all of his stresses. He was just kind of, tell he was like unloading on me. He was like, I'm stressed about this, stressed about that. And if it was just one stress, I could handle it, but it's stacks of stress. Like David said in Psalm 20, he said, some people trust in chariots and horses. This is Psalm 20, verse seven. Some people put their trust in chariots and horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. This, um, on this road trip, Ashley said Idaho was calling her name on the way back. And I was like, well, we gotta get back for Abby's shower because Abby's having a second baby, the Henshaws, and they're trying to catch up with us. They're gonna have five kids, I think. But <laughs> we had to get back for the baby shower. And... Um, and, and so I said, we got like, we got to hurry. And she said, well, Idaho's calling my name. We got to drive through Idaho. I was like, all right. So we stop in Idaho, we find this lake and we asked a marina, we said, could we rent, you know, some paddle boards? And he said, yeah, I'll give you two paddle boards for two hours for like 15 bucks. We're like, yes, done, let's do this. And we didn't know how to paddle board. And we're learning <laughs> with all of our children on the paddle board. And they're like, you guys don't know what you're doing. We're like, stop it. You know, you know attitude check, tune up. Trust your parents. Don't trust in horses and chariots. God's got it. Hot pockets, okay? Um, <laughs> and so, anyways, the bottom line is we're out there, and we started realizing that paddle boards work based on where you place the weight. And the weight has to be in the right place, and people have to sit in the right seat. Otherwise, the paddle board will sink. And so we had to be careful about who we placed in, we, in which seat. And this is important for leaders, because as leaders, we're always asking who should sit in which seat on the bus? And we gotta make sure that we have people in the right seats, and then we also gotta make sure that whoever's sitting in that seat can handle the weight of that seat. And so I'm watching, I'm going, Liam, you can't sit there because you're heavier than Mac, and Mac, you can't, it's, it's an arrangement. 
you know, game. It's a Tetris game. You're trying to figure out how to make this thing work. So I'm like, I'm going to lean here. Mac, you're going to sit there. Liam, you're going to sit there. Ellie, you sit over there. And then Ash is on her board. And she's like, okay, Gianna, sit there. And Vinny, sit there. And we're trying to navigate. And, then, you know, our kids are just watching their parents figure this out. The joy of being a pastor's kid, just watching your parents figure it out. I watched my mom and dad figure out some of their own paddleboard tricks, too here at Victory in the Mavy Center in the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s. But you know, our kids are watching it. And that's why I have a big heart for pastor's kids, by the way. Um, I, like I, someone asked me if I would help their, their child and they're a pastor. And I said, absolutely, because you, I've watched what our family walked through, what other families have walked through. And so we're watching this. And then I realized, I said, we're too heavy in this area. We're putting too much weight in this area. I think David had to realize where to put the weight, where to put the trust. Some people trust in horses and chairs. Some people put their trust in their spouse. Some people put their trust in their kids. Some people put their trust in the president, the government, their 401k. Some people put their trust in themselves and what they can accomplish. But we put our trust in the name of the Lord. Where you put the weight matters. Because if you put the weight in the wrong place, you're going to sink. If you, put, if you tune it to, the, to something that can't sustain it, it's not going to sound good. But if you will tune your heart to put your trust in the Lord, no matter who's in office in the White House, no matter what happens in your life, no matter who comes and goes in the church, you're going to sail through every storm. When the storms come, your boat won't sink because your weight is not in yourself. It's not in people. It's not in government. It's not in horses or chariots or the economy or the inflation. My hope is in the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and all the oil underneath it. Because anytime you walk through something that's crazy and scary and painful, you start looking for someone to blame. Like it's someone's fault. This past month, our family went on a road trip. And uh, while we were on this road trip, it was a 60 hour road trip, which is crazy, y'all. Ashley surprised me. I was in the mountains praying, trying to get a word from God for our church. And Ashley called me and she said, what if I brought all the kids and met you in the mountains? And I was like, that's crazy. She was like, what if I drove and did a road trip to meet you? I was like, you would never do that. She's like, I'm halfway there. <laughs> She's like, I'll see you in Oregon on Sunday. <laughs> you know, and so sure enough, Ashley drove 26 hours by herself with all five kids. Y'all, we got five kids. That's pretty wild. And um, she shows up. She's like, it's your turn to drive now. I was like, okay. So... I, I did. I got in the driver's seat. We, we stopped to get some groceries. We were going to be driving back to Tulsa together with all five kids. And, and, um, and as we stopped to get groceries, we start driving down the road. And one of our kids feels this breeze. And he's like, there's this breeze going on. He's like, I don't know what's going on. One of our doors had been left open, the back door. So I was like, oh, my goodness, go shut the door. So Ashley jumps out. She shuts the door. We keep driving several hours. We find a friend that we knew in Oregon. We stayed at their house that night. And as we're unloading our bags, I'm looking, I don't see my luggage anywhere. I don't see my backpack, my laptop, my iPad. My <laughs> and I look at Ashley and I go, hey, did you see anything when you shut the door after that grocery you know, stop? And she was like, I didn't see anything. So then I looked at the kids, I said, hey, did you guys take daddy's bags? And they're like, no. And I get an email later that night, some lady, this was really nice, but really interesting. This lady emails me. She said, I found your bags and your email was in your Bible because my Bible was in my bag. She said, I just want you to know I placed them in the median in the middle of the road. She was like, they're waiting for you in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> that was three hours back. And I was so stressed. I was like, all my sermons. 15 years of writing sermons and books were in that laptop and, and, and I don't have saved copies of all that stuff and I didn't save it to the cloud and, and I was like, oh my goodness. And then my favorite victory t-shirts were in there and my favorite swimming shorts and my favorite victory hat we gave at Father's Day, all this stuff and I'm going through it. So then I call anybody who lives in Portland. I'm like, please go search for this. And then I start seeing it move on the Find My app on my phone. Everything's moving. And I realized someone had stolen my stuff and it was gone. And they were like, dude, there's nothing in the median anywhere. And, um, and I, was, I was upset. I was looking for someone to blame. I was like, Ashley, the kids. I was getting stressed, right? Because anytime you lose something, you start getting stressed. Anytime you walk through any kind of transition in your life, it can stir up stress. 
And so here David is, he's, he's stressed, his men are stressed, they're talking about killing him, and everyone's getting bitter because of their disappointment, and they're all wanting to throw in the towel. And I love the end of this verse, it says, but David found strength in the Lord his God. And I wanna to talk to you today about finding strength, getting your heart back in tune when you feel like your strength is gone, your energy is gone, your mind, your heart feels overwhelmed. So Lord, I pray you speak to us today and that we leave changed from the way we came in here. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. So I started playing guitar when I was about 12 years old and um, I grew up with a mom. Yeah, I grew up with a mom um, <laughs> who was a worship leader and uh, she was always in the house singing, playing her piano and, and uh, it made me wanna learn instruments. It made me wanna learn guitar specifically and piano. And uh, this one guy who was giving me lessons, he said, Paul, the best guitar you can get is a Martin. You need to get a Martin guitar. And I was like, why? What's so good about a Martin? He's like, it's the best sounding guitar. If you wanna get a good sounding guitar, you gotta get a Martin. But he said, here's the thing about instruments. Instruments will never exceed the musician who plays them. I know that's, like a, like, that's huge. You're like, whoa, it's big. No, no, no. The reality is, no matter how good the instrument is, if I don't practice and I don't learn it, it'll never sound better than me. Whoever plays the instrument has the power to make it sound good or make it sound bad. And in the same way, an instrument, the longer you play it, the more you play it, the more it needs tuning. I want my friend Guy to come out here. Guy, wherever you are, he, he's a way better guitar player than me. And uh, Guy is someone who has oftentimes played drums, guitar, bass, like you name it. This guy over here is just a, a musical genius. But Guy, come over here. How often do you tune your guitar? Every song. Every song he tunes his guitar. So he doesn't tune it once a year. He doesn't tune it once a month. He doesn't tune it once a week. He tunes it between every single song. I think it's interesting that, that Paul said, set your hearts, set your minds on things above. And he's saying this to a church of Christians. He's not saying this to you know, people who aren't saved. He's saying this to people who have been saved. Sometimes in the Christian you know, world, we can think that we set things permanently. That once I go down to an altar, my heart is set forever on the affections of Christ. And I am always the most selfless, patient, kind human being ever. But how many of y'all know you need more than one altar call to stay saved? I'm not saying that you lose your salvation. I'm just saying your salvation needs constant tuning. There's a reason why they tell you to get your car tuned up. On our road trip, we stopped in, in Portland and uh, where my bags were lost. And while we were there, we stopped to get a tune-up because we had been driving 2,000 miles. And the guy said, what, do you want the regular tune-up? We said, yeah. Um, he said, I'll change all this stuff. I'll fill up all this stuff. There's some areas that you've, you've, you've lost some things, some fluids, they're dry. You gotta get a tune-up. Everybody say tune-up. So as cars need tune-ups, so do souls, so do hearts, and so do guitars. There's this old hymn that... Uh, I remember hearing as a kid, and it's a, it's a hymn that honestly kind of inspired this message. It goes like this. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above, praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy unchanging love. But I love the very first part of that. He says, um, come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart, tune my heart, tune my heart to sing thy grace, tune my heart. Because sometimes my heart gets out of tune. Sometimes I'm singing, tune. You're like, that sounds bad. Tune my heart, tune my heart, tune my heart, tune. Sometimes we hit the wrong note. Sometimes we go through things that don't make sense and it gets us out of tune. Gee, I'm gonna play and I want you to just be the devil. You're not a devil, but I want you to just kind of sneak in with some distraction. sounds bad. 
And here's what happens. When things get out of tune in our life, we look for someone to blame. And then we get upset. We're like, my guitar's out of tune. Something's wrong with this guitar. This thing used to work. I just need to get a new guitar. I just need to get a new husband. I just need to get a new wife. I just need to quit my job. I need to get out of church. I need to stop being around these people because they're out of tune. Before you trash it, tune it. Before you throw it in the trash, tune it. Before you blame it on everybody else, tune your own guitar. Tune your own heart. Yesterday, I was at this outreach, our backpack outreach, and I was walking around, and I was like, man, everybody has bad odor. Like, everybody's armpits smell bad. I'm giving hugs to everybody. I'm like, hmm, people need to wear deodorant. And then I start smelling myself. I was like, I'm the one who stinks. I didn't wear deodorant. This I had woken up thinking I had sprayed cologne or deodorant. I didn't do none of that. I smelled like a road trip guy. I smelled like I've been on the road for the last couple of weeks. And I was like, it's me. I'm the problem. It's me. No, it's not everybody else. Everybody say, tune your own heart. I need some help. Sometimes you can't tune your heart. Sometimes you need someone from the outside. Guy, will you tune my heart for me? Will you tune this guitar for me? Here's the point. Life happens. Stress happens. David is greatly distressed in 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. And it's in this moment that he has a choice. Do I stay stressed? Do I let the life things that are happening around me stir up more resentment, anger, bitterness, disappointment? I was talking to this guy the other day, and he was saying, he said, man, it's, it's just so much is going on right now. There's so much going on in the world, right? There's financial stress. Like, I, I don't know how to pay the bills, and I, I want to be able to have a day off, but I have to work an extra job. And so there's financial stress, and there's inflation stress. Like, I, I went to go buy a sandwich the other day, and what used to cost $6 for a roast beef sandwich is now $12. It's, it's double for the milk now. And, and, and you're like, what happened to the sandwiches? And then it's family stress. There's just drama and trauma in the family. And then there's raising kids in a crazy world kind of stress. I was driving down the road the other day, and, and there was a sign, and thank goodness there was nothing on this sign physically. It was just the words, and it said, Victoria's Secret. And my son, nine years old, he goes, Daddy, what's Victoria's Secret? Can we go there? And I was like, no, we're not going to go there. And he's like, well, why does she have a secret? What's her secret? I was like, like we're... And, 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 and then, then, then we turn on the TV, and it's the Olympics, and, and you never know when there's a drag show with men in thongs in front of children, and you're like, Paul, don't talk about this. It's church. I'm telling you, we got to talk about it in church, because where else are we going to address the insanity of raising kids in a messed up world? Y'all, our world is crazy. Our world is crazy, and so there's the stress of raising kids and trying to blind their eyes and stop them from looking at the porn that's out there everywhere, available on anything, and then there's gas price stress, which thankfully it started going down this morning. Everybody go to Sam's Choice after this and get $2 gas, but there's stress, and then there's not feeling good enough. There's not feeling good enough. It's like, man, I, I try my best, but I just never feel like I'm enough. I feel like I keep coming up short. I feel like I'm not where I want to be. I, I feel like I'm behind on my goals kind of stress. Like I set some goals to lose weight at the start of the year and I gained the exact weight I was hoping to lose on top of the weight I already had. And then there's political election year stress and you're like, stay out of that, Paul. Don't talk about it. The stress is overwhelming. And somewhere, somewhere in the middle of all this stress, we find ourselves under the stress and it's stacked on top of us and I'm stressed and I'm overwhelmed. I was with my kids a lot this last month. I'll come under this one. Hello. And um, in the middle of the stress, one, one day it started storming a lot while we were trying to have a good day. And, and I remember just in that moment, the storm was coming. It was raining. It was, you know, it was kind of ruining a lot of the day. And then I was worried, finances. How do you feed five kids and then just try to, try to stay on top of everything else? And, and then, you know, here's the other thing. Taking a break is good, but um, trusting people is hard. And, and, and then when you're gone and people are good without you, you're like, do they even need me anymore? I'm not even needed anymore. I'm not good enough. I, everybody's, and then, so there's friend stress and marriage stress. And I was getting a haircut the other day. 
And I said, how's my hair look? He said, I'm seeing a lot of gray hairs out here. I said, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. I reverse the curse of aging off my life in Jesus' name. <laughs> you know? And so there's all this stress. And then the more stress you have, the more stress you take on. And when we were outside, it started pouring rain. And one of our kids looked at me and said, um, it's fun when it rains, right? I was like, not always. And he's like, but let's, let's make this a fun time. Remember the other day we were listening to that song, singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. What a wonderful feeling. I'm laughing at clouds so dark up above. I'm singing, singing in the rain. I'm dancing in the rain, just dancing in the rain. What a wonderful feeling. It's not always wonderful. And it can feel out of tune. And it can feel like all these things are messing with the tune of your heart, your soul, and you're feeling stressed and you're feeling frustrated and your temper is getting shorter and shorter with people. I love what David did in 1 Samuel 30. It says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord. Instead of throwing away his purpose, instead of walking away from it all, instead of jumping off a cliff, the, the world says, follow your heart, but God says, follow the word, follow truth, because your heart will lie to you. Your heart can be a liar to you. Speaking of liars, look at Psalms 144. Psalms 144. All right, Psalm 144, David says, he trains my hands for war, but he is my loving God. He's my fortress, he's my stronghold. Now, David wasn't in a fight right here against people. Look at this in verse, let's go to verse seven. Reach down your hand from on high, deliver me, rescue me from the mighty waters, from the hands of foreigners, whose mouths are full of lies, he says. So he's in a fight against lies, whose right hands are deceitful. And then he says, I will sing a new song to you, my God, on the 10 stringed lyre. So David, he knew how to deal with liars. A lyre was a, uh, it was like a guitar, it was like a harp, it was a seven string guitar, it was more of a harp, it was a standing up thing. But I, I want you to listen to that word liar in more ways than one. It's a double meaning word. It's, it's an instrument, but it's also the fight that David's in. David's in a fight against lies coming from the outside from other people. David's in a fight against the lies of not feeling good enough to lead his men. David's in a fight against the lies of feeling like he's lost some of the things he used to have. David's in a fight against what people are saying about him, but he's also in a fight against the lies he's saying about himself. And David said, I'll sing a new song on the lyre. And then he says in the next verse, he says, Lord, deliver me, deliver your servant from the lies of other people. So what David had to do is he had to learn to get his heart back in tune to the truth of God's word. David had to learn to tune his heart. I think it's back in tune now. There it is. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. See, sometimes our hearts get out of tune. Sometimes our minds get out of tune. And this is why Paul told the church, set your heart, set your mind on things above. David said, Lord, get my heart back to your truth. Before you throw it in the trash, tune it. We all need to tune up and we all need to learn to handle the stress. If I could see Jesus coming in the middle of your stress, and Israel, you could play, we're gonna worship in a second. But if I could see Jesus coming in the middle, I don't think he would be down here where I was singing. I don't think he would be right here. I think Jesus would sit right on top of it. And as Jesus sits on top of your financial stress, as Jesus sits on top of you feeling behind on everything you need to do, as Jesus sits on top of your loneliness, as Jesus sits on top of not feeling good enough, it all starts to collapse because the things that are stacked on top of you right now are not as strong as you think they are. The things that you think are weighing you down are not as heavy as you've made them out to be. Jesus said, why do you worry? Look at the birds, look at the flowers. Don't, doesn't your heavenly father know what you need and he takes care of you. If you seek first the king, set your heart on things above. Set your mind on things. See, the Bible says that Jesus is seated in heavenly places and so are we. So here's where I think Jesus wants us to sit right now during an election year. 
where you don't know what's gonna happen. Every single day there's something new. It's like there was an assassination attempt on former President Trump. Then, you know, President Biden announces he's no longer running. And Vice President Kamala Harris announced she's running. And it's like every day there's new stuff. And then there's division. Oh, my goodness. The, the world has pitted us against each other. And you don't know what you can say. And then there's triggers with everybody. And there's stress. And I don't know what to do. And how do I handle this family member who thinks differently than me on this? And yet Jesus is seated in heavenly places. And he says, set your heart on things above where he is seated and you be seated. Sit down in the same place of peace that Jesus is sitting in. Sit down in the same place of joy. Where David had to learn how to get his mind and his heart back was not in recovering his stuff that had been stolen. David had to get his mind and heart back when he didn't get it all back. You can get your mind and heart back before you get your stuff back. I was on that road trip and I never got anything replaced on that road trip. Now, thank goodness that I've got an iPad now. And you know what the Lord told me? The Lord said, Paul, you lost all that stuff you've been working on, but I'm about to give you some new sermons. I'm about to give you some new books. I'm making room for some new stuff I wanna do in you. Don't fret what you lost. I got better things in front of you. Sometimes God leads us through loss to teach us that we can live without the stuff we thought we had to have. And because God wants us to learn to trust in him. So here David is and he's tuning his heart. What key are you in, Israel? <laughs> there we go, there we go. Sometimes when you go through those feelings and seasons that are stressful, you need to get your heart back in tune. I wanna give you four ways to get your heart back in tune. Number one, tune your heart to the word of God, to the truth of God's word. David said, deliver me from the liars. Now he was playing on a liar, but then he was singing about being delivered from liars. He was playing on a guitar that was called a liar, but he was also singing about being delivered from the lies of others about him, the deception of others. How do we get back to the truth of, of what God says? We stop feeding so much of our mind and heart on all the stuff out there. You know, there's just rabbit trails that are vying for our attention, that are just trying to shift our eyes from what's truthful. And there's lies from the enemy stirring us up trying to get us to have a pity party, trying to get us to have condemnation in our hearts, trying to make us feel discouraged and disappointed, defeated. But when I start to wash myself in the word of God, and I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. When we begin to get back to that place of what does God say about me? What does God say about my future? God says he has good plans for me. God says he's got hope and a future for me. God says he has plans to prosper me. Jesus said I came to give you life and life more abundantly. There is a liar, but it is not God. The father of lies, the devil, he speaks lies on a regular basis, lies of condemnation, lies of saying, you missed it, you missed your chance, you're not as good as them, they're better than you, you're unqualified, you're so behind, all of those lies. But you know what God is saying? He's saying, you're more than a conqueror. Greater is he who lives in you than he that's in the world. I am confident that he who began this good work in you will be faithful to complete it. We get renewed by getting our minds back to the word of God. So when my guitar gets out of tune, when someone says something mean to me. Y'all, we have a teenager in our house now. He actually told me that. He was like, sup, Padre? I was like, stop that right now. I'm gonna spank you. <laughs> I said, you don't call me that. You call me Dada. He goes, Dada? That was like when I was five. He's like, I'm a teenager now. I was like, what? You're not a teenager. He said, I didn't say teenager, Padre. I said, teenager. I said, this attitude has got to stop now. This is out of tune. We need to get a tune up on this attitude. And, um, you know, he sat down. He's like, okay, what do you want me to call you? I was like, dad, dad, daddy. And he was like, but dad, I'm growing up. I was like, I know, but I still need you to be little, little guy. <laughs> he was like, I'm getting older now. I'm going into middle school. I was like, ah.
I had to pray, y'all. I was like, Lord, do I spank him? Do I put him in timeout? What do I do? I take away his Nintendo? I don't know. And then I realized, you know, I just need to talk to him. I just need to have a heart to heart. Sometimes to get back in tune, we, we try so many different remedies besides getting back to the word of God. Like we get into a fight with our spouse and we're like, oh, I just need them to change. What if you need to change though? I just need them to stop being so prideful and stubborn and, and, and what, what if I need to tune up? I just wish my boss would just see what I do for him and her and I just wish they would appreciate. No, no, no. What if we're the ones that need to tune up instead of everybody else? And, and so I go back to the word of God. God, what are you asking me to work on? David said, mm, search me, oh God. And oh my every thought, renew my mind, take my life, I'm all yours. And look inside my heart, remove every part that does not glorify you, Lord, I'm all yours. David was always investigating his own soul. You know what made David different than Saul? Saul didn't sin like David. David sinned actually worse than Saul did. But Saul was never called a man after God's own heart. Here's why. David's heart was constantly in a posture of getting tuned. He was always saying, God, I'm sorry. I was, I was wrong. God, you, you alone are the one I've sinned against. Saul didn't care what God thought. Saul lived for himself. He was self-preserving, didn't fear God, just cared about what people thought. David was so always on that altar of just saying, Lord, tune my heart. I, I got upset at my son today. I got frustrated. Lord, tune my heart, tune my heart. Number two, we tune our hearts to worship. How do I get my heart back in tune? I tune it to worship. Because I'm tempted to complain and I'm tempted to have a pity party and I'm tempted to, to ask for all the attention on me when God says, if you'll shift the attention off you and shift it on me, I'll actually fix the thing you're worried about. If we would spend more time in quiet and private worshiping God, I think God would work out a lot of the things that we're worried about, and we would stop fighting in our own strength. When my heart's in tune with God, I don't have to defend myself as much. When my heart's in tune with God, I'm not trying to fight the battles in my own strength. When my heart's in tune with God, I'm not so worried about what everyone else thinks about me. I'm more focused on the, the main applause, the applause of heaven. When, I, when my heart's in tune with God, I'm confident. I can slay Goliath. When my heart's in tune with God, I can dodge spears and not throw them back at people. When my heart's in tune with God, I can turn the other cheek. I can forgive people. But when my heart gets out of tune, you better watch out because I'll come swinging and I'll get upset and my temper gets upset and I'm, I'm a grumpy old man. <laughs> so I gotta get back to worship. I gotta get back to that place of saying, Lord, you, you alone deserve the glory. And worthy you are, worthy you are. Worthy you will be forever always. Worthy you were, worthy you are, worthy you will be forever Yahweh. Worthy you were, worthy you are, worthy you will be forever Yahweh. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. What's happening though, I think even as we're in here, is our hearts are actually getting tuned. I can feel the Holy Spirit just coming in. And I, I can just see it right now. It's almost like the Lord's coming in and he's, he's like this perfect guitar instructor. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's why you got angry at church. That's why you were frustrated in the parking lot. That's why you were feeling so lonely this week. That's why you were having a hard time celebrating other people's rest. That's why you were having a hard time celebrating other people's 
accomplishments and you were, it's like the Holy Spirit's coming and he's like, let me help you. Let me help you because God is, he's up to something good. And number three, tune your heart to faith in God. Tune your heart to faith in God. The enemy comes in and he tries to steal from David and he takes his wife and he takes his kids and he takes the confidence of his men and David's discouraged, he's distressed, he's overwhelmed, but the Bible says he strengthened himself in the Lord. He gets his composure back. Get back up, Paul. Get back up, David. Don't throw away your calling. Don't throw it in the trash. Just tune it. Just tune it. You need a tune up. You don't need to trash it. You just need to tune it. And so David begins to tune his heart back to faith. And he asks in verse 7, 1 Samuel 30, he says, bring me the ephod. Can I get the ephod? The ephod, back then they didn't have Bibles. They, all they had was, they had this, this um, symbol of getting direction from God. He says, bring me the ephod. I need to hear from God. So then in verse 8, he asks God. He takes the ephod and he inquires of the Lord. He says, Lord, what should I do next? What's my next step? I'm in the middle of some distress and discouragement. What do you want me to do? Will I, will I win if I go after these enemies that have stolen from me? And God says, pursue them. You will certainly see the victory, but you have to take a step. Faith requires action, not just thought and belief and words. It's good to say, hey, my son will be healed. It's good to say, hey, we're gonna see financial prosperity. It's good to say, but you have to take an action step. So God says, pursue them and you will see the victory. This is a year to pursue victory in your life. And that might mean getting back to tithing. That might mean signing up for discipleship class. That might mean going to rehab. That might mean getting in some counseling and going to see a, a, a Christian psychologist. That might mean getting out of some things that you've been giving too much energy to. That might mean giving up your phone for a little bit. That might mean getting rid of the TV out of the house for a second. But if you'll take a step of faith, God says, if you'll pursue victory, you'll see the victory. Get back to your purpose. So God tells David, David, you got a purpose. Get back to it. Number four, tune your heart to getting refreshed in his presence. This is what's been happening today. This is why we can't forsake the assembling of, of coming together is because there's a, a tuning that happens. We get back to the sound of victory, get back to the sound of faith. I want you to stand together with me today. We're gonna worship a little bit. What key are you guys in now? G? We're gonna worship and we're gonna let the Holy Spirit begin to tune our hearts back to his word. Here's the beautiful thing with David. After David gets strengthened in the Lord, gets his heart back in tune, the Bible says in verse 18 and 19 that David went and he got everything back that had been stolen from him. He got everything back that had been stolen from him. And when he came back, he had more than enough to share everything. Nothing was missing. Nothing was missing. Not a boy, not a girl, not a person, not everything they had taken. God's about to recover everything the enemy has stolen from you. God's about to get you back to that place of joy, laughter, peace. You know, Ashley said it earlier, we started that, that boat ride and the clouds were heavy, it was dark, it was rainy, but by the time it ended, it was the most beautiful sunset I'd ever seen. And I just feel like some of you have been walking through a storm. You've been walking through some cloudy storms, just like Ashley was talking about, but God says there's a, sun, there's a sunset on the other side of this that's the best sunset you've ever seen. On the other side of this storm, on the other side of these clouds, you're gonna be cleaner, you're gonna be more pure, you're gonna be more free, you're gonna be more joyful, you're gonna laugh more than you used to laugh from before, you're gonna be able to smile with genuine joy on the inside, you're gonna see victory in those areas where you've been stressed, you're gonna see financial prosperity, but, but here, here's the key, we gotta get our hearts back in tune. We gotta get back to that place of surrender. We gotta allow the Holy Spirit to begin to work on us. So I, don't want, I want us all over this room, just every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, I just pray for every man in the room, every woman in the room. God, every teenager, every young adult. Lord, I thank you that in the midst of so much confusion in the world, we can find peace. In the midst of so much darkness in the world, we can find light. God, I thank you for revival coming to your church right now. Lord, I thank you where the enemy has stirred up so much uh, just animosity. God, that you're about to pour your love out through the church and to bring healing and revival. God, I pray for someone here today who's just been discouraged. They've been disappointed. They've been stressed. They've been disillusioned. That today, God, you're getting their heart back in tune. I pray for someone in the room who's just felt behind. 
They've just been feeling like they're behind in so many goals and so many things that today you're getting their heart back in tune. I pray for someone who just feels tired today. The heat has just taken a toll. These 100 degree days has just been beating down and they've just felt exhausted and dehydrated that today your presence is getting their heart back in tune. They're getting their energy back. You said those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like an eagle. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Lord, I thank you that today as we've been in your presence, as we've been in your presence, as we've been worshiping you, studying your word, your truth, God, that you're tuning our heart to the sound of faith, to the sound of hope, to the sound of life, to the sound of victory. If you're here today and you just need a tune-up right now, I want you to just leave your seat. Come and find a place at this altar. Just come and join me all around this altar. If you need the Holy Spirit to tune an area of your mind, your heart, your life, maybe you wanna come as a family, come with your spouse, come by yourself. But if you just feel like the enemy's been kind of messing with you a little bit, trying to get you out of tune, get your attitude out of tune, get your life out of tune, today, just come and get back in tune, just worship. We're just gonna come down, we're gonna worship right now. We're gonna pray, we're gonna let the Holy Spirit begin to move. Go ahead, Lamar. Just sing it out. Jesus 
pray that you would tune our hearts today, God, to trust you more, to let go of the hurts, the wounds that we hold on to, to stop trying to defend ourselves all the time and fight our own battles, but Lord, to let you fight for us. God, to seek you first. Lord, I pray, you know, I had this vision in this last service, and I got to say it to someone, because finances are a tight thing right now, really tight thing. Everyone I'm talking to, it's like, man, just so much inflation and all the craziness. And we were driving on that road trip through Wyoming back down to Oklahoma. And it was like getting close to the end of the night. And I looked out the window and I just saw thousands of cows, just thousands. I mean, you just couldn't see the end of it. And they were on hills. It was multiple hills of all these cows. And I was reminded of the scripture my parents taught me at a young age that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And I was thinking about, man, you know, our world and just raising kids and five bellies to feed, all that stuff. And it was like the Lord whispered, Paul, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. You can't even see a thousand hills. You see a few, but you only see a few thousand cows, but I own the cattle on a thousand hills and all the oil underneath it. You know, I'm thankful for air conditioning during these hot summer days. Last year or 18 months ago, we had to replace our air conditioner unit for the whole church. It services the school this building, the next gen building. It's a very expensive unit. You know, you think about what it costs to get air conditioning just for your car, your house, but to get air conditioning for all the classrooms, this church and that next gen building, it's a million dollars to replace. And it hit us right after COVID and, and financially, we were just like, we can't afford this right now. I don't know how we're gonna do this and our church is gonna be sweaty coming into church and you know, like not, not, not a lot of people enjoy just sitting in a sweaty church room and kids in classrooms sweating. We started praying and out of nowhere through just a variety of people, not even in our church, but working with, with the, the contractors and the ones who replaced it, the church didn't have to pay hardly a dime. They replaced almost a million dollars gifted of an air conditioning unit. And you know what I heard the Lord say? You know what I heard the Lord say? I heard the Lord say, there's more where that came from. Sometimes we doubt what God can do when we're in a tough time, when, when finances are stressful in life, and you're like, man, I, how do I afford to go to college? And how do I afford this, pay for kids, that, and all that? But I just hear the Lord saying, I got you. I got you. God's got it. Hot pockets. He's got it. He's going to get you through this. And if we'll get our hearts out of the place of fear, out of the place of anxiety, bitterness, anger, sin, all the things that are going on that are just weighing us down, distractions, addictions, if we'll get to that place of purity to say, Lord, search me, renew my mind, deliver me, God, tune my heart away from the lies of the enemy, the lies of defeat, the lies of inadequacy, the lies of insecurity, the lies of, of I'm not gonna make it. Tune me to the truth of your word, God, that you're, you're with me, you got this. You're gonna get me through this. You got the, you got the provision, the protection. You got what you, God, you're gonna give me what I need for when I need it. And if I don't need it, I don't, if I don't have it, I don't need it. God's gonna provide every step of the way. Lord, I just pray that you would tune our hearts to that today. Tune our hearts to the truth of your provision, your protection. Just say this with me, Jesus, I surrender to you. Tune my heart to your truth. I will follow you. I will listen to you. I will pursue you. I will get renewed in your word. Refresh me, Lord. Revive me. Forgive me, Lord, where I've missed it. I repent. And I'm running towards you, God. 
Tune my heart to the sound of victory, to the sound of hope, to the sound of faith, to the sound of joy. Depression, you got to go. You can't stay in me anymore. I'm a child of God. Fear, you got to go. Sin, you got to go. Darkness, you got to go. I'm a child of God. Thank you, Jesus, that I have the victory, that you're not finished with me yet. And my best days are right in front of me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I love you. God loves you. Be blessed. Victory.